helping promote authors whose you know book tours might have gotten canceled. Some local authors that uh, we want to share with you today. So um, let's see. Um, if Jennifer is here, you can just connect, um, ask to join. Um, if you've missed any of our previous literary lunch breaks, um, they are all on our website at texasbookfestival.org. Oh, looks like she's here. Um, let's see. Hello. Hi, how's it going? Good. Okay, we're connected. Excellent. <laughs> um, well, welcome to Texas Book Festival's Literary Lunch Break. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. This was like, a, this required like a lot of tech support from my husband, and I'm now <laughs> situated with a lamp over a um, over a box of diapers on a high chair. So if there's some calamitous collapse, you'll know that that's why. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> it'll be very exciting for yeah, for yes. us. <laughs> for everyone watching. Um, cool. So um, I will just let our let our viewers know um, who you are and what your book is. Um, and then maybe you can um, read a little bit and then we can go into some questions. Oh, sure. Um, so I'll just let everyone know uh, Jennifer Dubois here on the bottom of our screen is the author of three novels, including A Partial History of Lost Causes, which won the California Book Book Award for Fiction, a Northern California Book Award for First Fiction, and was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Prize for Debut Fiction. The National Book Foundation named her one of its five under 35 authors. Her second novel, Cartwheel, was the winner of a Housatonic Book Award for Fiction and was a finalist for the New York Public Library Young Lions Award. Um, she is an alumna of the Iowa Writers Workshop and Stanford University's Stegner Fellowship. Um, and she's also the recipient of a Whiting Award and a National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowship. Um, and she currently teaches at Texas State University. Um, do you have the spectators with you to show everyone? Oh, yes, I do. The cover. This is, yes, very striking. Eyeball. Yes, I love that cover. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I love the spectators. And so I'm so excited that you're here to, sh to share it with everyone. Um, you. So maybe do you want to just read maybe a couple paragraphs to bring us into the world? Uh, sure. Um, let's see. If I can find maybe I'll just read you a couple um, paragraphs from the very first uh, chapter. Sure. Um, this is in 1993. And the narrator here, Cell, works as a publicist for a show that's very similar to the Jerry Springer show. Um, okay. Cell is in the green room pre-interviewing the devil boy when the first reports of the shooting come in. The devil boy's name is Ezra Rosenzweig, though Cell has been told to address him only as Damien. He has a black odalisk neck tattoo and thumb-sized subdermal horn implants. Cell keeps expecting these to twitch expressively somehow like the ears of a small dog. But the devil boy's horns do not move, and alongside his shaved eyebrows, they contribute to an expression of general impassivity. So Cell doesn't quite register the extent of his surprise when he stops speaking of satanic baptismal rites and says, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, if, you're just, if you're just joining us, we're here with Jennifer Dubois, author of The Spectators. Um, and so I'll just jump right in with questions. Um, and then if we have time at the end, um, we can open it up to some questions for the, for the viewers and um, for everyone watching. If you have a question, um, save it till the end and then um, you could comment at the bottom and then we'll, we'll see if we can get to them. Um, so I wanted to talk about TV to start um, and the, the role that TV plays in this move, in this novel, excuse me. Um, there's, a lot of discussion about how television and a very specific television personality um, can have an effect on the public and sort of speak to people in different ways. And uh, there's some obvious influence from the Jerry Springer show in here. And I guess um, what interested you so much about that, that you wanted to um, write this novel? Yeah, so the the inspiration for the novel was actually a, um, a This American Life episode about the backstory of the real life Jerry Springer, who I had not known 
was the mayor of Cincinnati and was a councilman in Cincinnati and was like this really beloved progressive politician um, who then had this interesting kind of political uh, career where he was initially kind of felled by a scandal where he paid for a prostitute with a check. Um, and that, But he actually kind of rebounded from that and, and was this really kind of substantive public figure who really saw himself as sort of a voice for the marginalized. Um, and that was the bulk of his career before he went into journalism and even his early forays into journalism were much more kind of like Phil Donahue kind of issues based. And then in the 90s, he becomes this Jerry Springer, you know, the, the kind of like specter of this ghoulish, you know, outlandish, over the top um, trash TV. And so just hearing about that trajectory as a novelist, I'm always looking for those big questions that feel really like irreducible, um, such that you just find yourself really pondering, like, how does that happen? Like, how does someone go from this kind of person to that kind of person? And so that was really the impetus for the book was in just kind of pondering that question and thinking, like, eventually thinking, like, yeah, that's, that's like a novel-sized question. That's so interesting. I did not know that about Jerry Springer, about his backstory. Would have thought. <laughs> um, but it makes so much sense, I guess, when you have someone with such personality, um, I guess, politics and television kind of go hand in hand, perhaps you're in the public eye. Um, and so as a follow up, I guess the novel, the present of the novel is set in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and television is a little bit different now. Um, there are still big personalities, but I guess most people find their news and, and interact with their, their celebrities um, online. And so I was wondering if, um, like after you wrote this or while you were writing it, if you thought about the difference between, you know, like a Jerry Springer type in the 90s and like what is happening now with certain personalities and people following on Instagram Live, for example. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do think that one thing that seems like it was very different in the, in the early 90s was this sort of more of a sense of like a, a media monoculture, of course, like the fact that you, you know, didn't have, um, you know, you started to have cable and such, but there was much more of um, like the Jerry Springer show just being this like incredibly popular cultural phenomenon that so many people watched and it was kind of ubiquitous. Um, and obviously, like now, um, you know, things are much more sort of fragmented across, you know, different different media and, um, you know, Netflix being, you know, 1 billion different um, shows and whatnot. So I think that that part of it is different. Um, and that also kind of relates to another thing that was an interesting constraint for me, or not a constraint, actually, just a, just an interesting feature of writing about 1993 was that in this book, um, the little segment I read was the, the sort of beginning of um, this through line about this school shooting that, ha that happens in the book. <clears throat> and in the book, this shooting really like dominates the news cycle for like an entire summer. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like what everybody is talking about and thinking about and the um, sort of notion that there might be a connection between this massively popular show and the shooters becomes like a really important um, conversation that the whole country is having. And that's also something that, you know, today school shootings are so common that, you know, they're, they barely register as a blip in the news cycle. We're so accustomed to them and, and one single one, um, unfortunately, would, would never kind of captivate and dominate and be treated as such a, you know, shocking kind of paradigm shifting event. So, um, so there, there were a lot of ways in which writing this book um, in 90, in, in 1993, um, you know, the, the fact that the setting was 1993 really enabled the plot in a lot of ways, because if it was set today, it would be, you know, a completely different relationship. Yeah, and I, I was thinking about that too, while I was reading it. Um, you know, I was a kid in the 90s, but I um, recall how even just 10 years ago, how things were covered um, and how it's so much different now. Um, and I thought it was so interesting that like in this book, there's, and I think this is like a normal human thing where people look for reason, right? Like there's this shooting and everyone wants to know why. And then there's something to like focus the attention on and and we have Maddie um and he ends up being I don't know he's an interesting character to me because you you see the man behind the the tv um and and then his relationship with Cell is really interesting as well and I guess could you talk about um like how you came up with her character and and why demonstrate their relationship um in the novel Mm -hmm. 
uh, so I guess to kind of go back to the origins of the novel, when I like her, when I learned this backstory of Jerry Springer, and I thought, okay, that's fascinating. And I, as someone who'd only known him from the perspective of the '90s, was really surprised by that. So I thought, um, so I thought about how interesting it would be to have a character who's kind of like a surrogate for that person. So in the book, Sells his publicist, but she really doesn't like him at first. She really kind of despises him, um, and over the course of the novel, she actually comes to a much more complex um, relationship or understanding of who this person is that's informed by learning about his past. And then at the same time, the other storyline is um, the story of his lover in the 60s and 70s, his male lover in, in, this is in New York City, who has sort of the opposite trajectory, who goes from like really idealizing and, and idealizing this man like romantically, but also politically in terms of his his um his moral character and then over the years becomes like very disillusioned so you kind of have two characters sort of moving in the opposite direction in terms of their regard for this guy and you as the reader you're hopefully kind of coming up with something in the middle like you're experiencing some shifting sense of him and sh shifting sympathies as well with Cell specifically i think one thing that interested me about her was i really wanted to create a female character who was like a a real shapeshifter somebody who um, had this capacity for sort of self reinvention. She's someone who's who comes from a pretty um, complicated, you know, um, economically disadvantaged background, and then she moves to New York and she kind of reinvents herself as this as this publicist. But she's kind of a little too good at like saying things she doesn't really mean or not considering really carefully like whether she means them or not. Um, and it's the book is in part sort of a coming of age story for her as somebody who has this kind of chameleon esque capacity and is kind of trying to figure out what to what to do with that you know how do you use, how do you use that in the world in the world in a way that is um is positive mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's part of her kind of journey yeah that's and especially probably as a as a young woman you know finding your your voice and and um navigating such a i guess male dominated mm -hmm. area um and it it also reminded me she she reminded me of like a political um, strategist a little bit too, because she's behind the scenes and she, she knows what to say. Um, so I, I thought that that connection was, was interesting as well. Um, I wanted to ask you, I guess pivoting a little bit away from the novel, but, but maybe not. Um, so you've been teaching for a, a little while mm -hmm. and um, were, were you teaching while you were writing this, this spectator? Um, yes, I was. I um, I think I got the idea right before I started my full time job at Texas State, and then um, I and then I wrote it since I've been full time at Texas State. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I wanted to ask, and and you know, a lot of writers are teachers as well. But how does that have an effect on your writing, and uh, or does it? And um, how do you find time to to write while you're also teaching? Yeah, I mean, that last question is, is a hard one. I mean, it's it. it I mean, it's like with any full time job, it's it's difficult to carve out time. Um, and I'm now a parent, as you can maybe hear in the background. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, typically summers would be the way to, to write. Um, not this summer so far due to no <laughs> Um But yeah, usually I get a lot of writing done during the summers and then just just it's sad but it's like during the school years typically I just try to make sure I get like one one night a week or something like just to sort of carve it out um mm -hmm. and in terms of the relationship between teaching and writing I mean I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword because on the one hand I do feel like I love reading books with my graduate students and talking about them and I'm always like reading new things that way that um and, and having like really in-depth conversations with super smart students and I think that that of course like always sort of informs and undergirds your your writing um and also I'm thinking about craft all the time and sometimes I feel like I'm still learning stuff about craft from these conversations the flip side of course is that if you you know read and write kind of constantly as your job that that can sort of like you know wear you out a little bit in terms of what you have the bandwidth to do um at, at the end of the day so, mm -hmm. so yeah I, th I would say it's a it's a it's a bit of a trade-off, but I think really any full-time job is, is, you know, I mean, your, your best bet is to just not have one if you want to really, <laughs> um, but there are drawbacks to that. So. Yes. Yes. Um, so what are you, are you working on anything now? Can you tell us anything about it? 
Yeah, I am. I, I actually finished a draft of a new, so after I wrote The Spectators, The Spectators is like super structurally complicated. It's got, you know, this one story that's in third person present tense and this one that's in this, you know, retrospective voice, the first person, and it's all over the map in terms of time. Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, in, during the process of revising that, I started fantasizing about my next book and I was like, it's going to be short. It's going to be one point of view. It's <laughs> linear and I had this idea that I don't want to talk about yet but I I was really excited about and so as soon as I finished the spectators this fourth book which is which is slim it's like more like it's like 40,000 words wow. um, it sort of came out really fast and so now I've just been sort of like slowly working on revisions um, for that so I would say it's this new book is um, it's really it's structurally straightforward but like very morally complicated um, and yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about it. I just hope that, you know, I hope that this summer I'll, I'll find some pocket of time to, to finish my revisions on that. That's so exciting. Um, and I was actually going to ask also, you know, so you're pivoting a little from, from this other book to do a more direct book. And so how is it working on the spectators after, um, after your, your previous book? Because it seems like you always have these, you know, all characters in, in all of your books, and there's always an element of suspense. And um, I guess, was there a little bit of a shift while you were writing The Spectators? Or was it more, um, I guess, on the on the same level of, of things that you usually write? You mean for this fourth book? Or you mean, is the third book sort of in? Uh, the third? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, they're all sim very similar in that I think a, each one of them is is somewhat obliquely inspired by some real life news story. In my first book, um, I I was interested in Gary Kasparov, who's this chess champion turned political dissident in Soviet and post Soviet Russia, and so that was an interesting trajectory. Kind of a similar question in a way to the Maddie M question. You know, interested in like how someone journeys from A to B, but it was also interested in this kind of philosophical question about. Um, you know, sort of quixotic um, quests of various kinds and, you know, how you find meaning when you know that something out, some an outcome is sort of preordained. And then the second book was sort of inspired by the Amanda Knox story. So it's set in Argentina and it's this young woman accused of murdering her roommate, but it's told from four different points of view. So you have um, some characters who are very allied with her and really believe in her innocence. And then you have the prosecutor who's kind of structurally aligned to believe in her guilt. And it's somewhat similar to the spectators in that, again, it's like a kaleidoscopic look at somebody and, and you, the reader, kind of have to figure out how to manage your sympathies and manage your um, beliefs about what has happened. And so, yeah, so, so you see the spectators is very much like in, in that same sequence. Um, and really the fourth book is too, in terms of it having like this kind of irreducible moral question at its center. It's just the first one where I've only, where I've told the story through one perspective. Cause usually I'm kind of playing with that by, you know, through the prism of like multiple, uh, multiple viewpoints, which is fun, mm -hmm. but it was, it was also kind of <laughs> nice to, to not, not do that for once. So yeah. What, one perspective. <laughs> what, um, what, well, what, I can't I'm wait to read it when it, when it eventually <laughs> does come out. Um, I guess we're we're almost out of time, but if anyone has questions, um, please please comment them below for Jennifer. I will just encourage everyone to pick up The Spectators because it's such a great read. Um, it's available wherever books are sold, um, in person and online, and that's what it. <laughs> um, <laughs> any any questions? <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, well. I just want to thank you so much again for joining us today. And um, do you, what are you reading? I guess, do you have any recommendations for, for everyone watching? Sure. Yeah. So one book I, that, that I think a lot of people read a few years ago, but I hadn't um, that I loved was manual for cleaning women by Lucia Berlin. Um, mm. Just amazing collection of short stories. Just like what a, what a voice, what a like, just you know truly authentic idiosyncratic um amazing uh she just reminds me of grace paley i just loved i love that and i just started reading this book the door